By religious methods, one can gain mental happiness. By worldly methods, one can gain some kind of physical comfort. One can now gain mental happiness. If by worldly methods and worldly items or possessions, we can gain happiness, then the more possessions we have, the more wealth we have, the more positions we have, the more power we have, the happier we should become. And in fact, if we honestly check well, people of high places and high positions, people of wealth, people of, of, of I would just say, um, power, are quite unhappy, do not have free time, have a lot of health problems, have a lot of worry, have a lot of tension. Even when they die at the time of death, they cannot die in peace, wondering what's going to happen behind them, who's going to hold the mantle. What's going to happen to their hard-earned wealth? What's going to happen to their hard-earned money? Worldly people and ordinary people who are ignorant, who do not know what brings happiness, are attached to worldly things. Diamonds, cars, houses, mates, friends, position, power. Worldly people who do not know the methods to happiness are attached. Therefore, if they have a car, if they have a diamond ring, if they have a nice house, then every single day they have it, it should create better and more and more and more and more and more happiness. In fact, when we get that position or possession on the first or second day, we may feel some sort of transitory happiness, but as the days go on, it becomes a problem or source of suffering. For example, a car. We'll have to maintain it. We'll have to pay its fees. We have to make sure that it's not broken. We have to make sure that we park it right. No one hits it. We have to make sure that it looks nice. The paint hasn't cracked. It's clean. Wash it. And then when it starts getting older, if we can sell it off. These are all subtle sources of suffering. These are all subtle sources of unhappiness. Yet our ignorant mind grasps on to such an object to think that it is happiness. Yet not knowing one is suffering, not knowing one is unhappy. That is applicable to all dharmas. All, all dharmas in this case mean all phenomena, all objects that we are attached to. Whether it be a mate, whether it be a friend, at first when we get married, our wife is very young, our wife is very beautiful, very attractive. As the years roll by, maybe she, gains a little, she gets a little pudgy, some lines, gray hairs come in, then we start looking at other people. We start looking at other things. It shows that all phenomenon is transitory. It shows that we are attached and we like things that we think bring us happiness, that we think bring us some kind of comfort. If it did bring us comfort, then from the day that we possessed and owned it, every single day, the happiness would increase, become better and better and better and more excellent and excellent. It doesn't mean you should go out and throw away your jewelry, your rings, your bank accounts, your wives. It doesn't mean that. What it means is not to be attached to it, to have it, to possess it, but at the same time, to realize that that is not what brings happiness, but those are supplements to keeping your body fit, keeping your mind in shape, so that you can look and practice and practice Dharma, so that you can gain real happiness. You should have a good place to stay. You should have comfortable food. You should maintain and take care of yourself. If you can afford, if you're in a high position in a job and you need to have cars that are attractive to impress others to get business or whatnot, it's all right. But to realize that that in itself is not the end. And that in itself is not good enough to justify yourself to only do that and not practice any dharma. Oh, I must take care of myself. I must gain well. I must gain position. I must gain this, 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 and that, and that, and that. That is not justifiable. Everything is transitory. Everything is moving. Everything comes to an end. Again, it regenerates itself in another form. Again, it regenerates itself. Yesterday, we gave the teachings on continuity or continuum. As I spoke yesterday, I will tell you about it briefly again, very briefly again today, which is everything moves on a continuity, as spoken by the great Dhamma Kitty. Everything moves on a continuity. Every single thing is continuous. It has to have a beginning, it has to have an end. 
The beginning is beginningless, but the end, there is an end. There is cessation to sufferings. Like all phenomena, as I talked about, has to have a beginning. A piece of paper. It must have been pressed, it must have been at the printers. Before that, it must have been pulped, it must have been a tree, it must have been a sapling, it must have been a seed. It must have been born from a previous tree. That from a previous tree, and on and on and on and on. In fact, the lineage is uncountable, innumerable. Like that, our human body is uncountable. Our body, our human body is innumerable. It has no end. It has no end. And it has no beginning. Right now it has no end. It has no beginning. We, our human bodies, in order for it to exist at this moment, had to have had a previous existence on the basis of logic. Our human body was existing at 8 o'clock. It has to have been around at 7. It must have been around at 6, at 5, at 4, at 3. Yesterday, the day before, last year, last month, 10 years ago, whatever. And if we were conceived at 10 a.m., as I explained yesterday, our body at 9.59 apparently was inside our parents. The red white cell and the white cell of the father, the red cell of the mother. These two cells must have come from our parents. For those two cells to come at, at 10 a.m., at 10 o'clock we were conceived. At 9.59, our bodies also had a previous moment. That previous moment was, it was inside our parents. Like that, when we trace back, when we trace back and back and back and back and back and back and back again and again and again, our parents must have came from their parents, from their parents, from their parents, from their parents, their parents, and their parents. Numerously. So much innumerable that almost uncountable, almost uncountable. Beyond human comprehension, beyond mental comprehension to be able to count how many, innumerable. Therefore, at 9.59, the white, the red left your parents, and enter into the womb of the mother and took rebirth, or how to say, took formation. You were conceived at 10 a.m. Similarly, that's where your physical body came from. Now, in order for your mind to exist at this moment, it must have been existing a previous moment. It is 8.20. It must have been existing at 8.19, 8.18, 8.17. It must have been existing at 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 6. It must have been existing yesterday. You see, the mind which means instantaneous. It, it moves on an instant, like this, like this, like this, like this. It moves constantly to form a continuum. The mind just doesn't exist and then goes. In order for it to have an existence at this moment, it must have had a previous moment, a previous, a previous, a previous, a continuum. Therefore, 8 o'clock, 801, 802, 803, 44, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, so on, continuously. In order for it to exist tomorrow, you must exist today, the mind. It cannot just appear tomorrow. Like that, like that, in order for your mind to exist at 8.20 now, it was existing at 8.19. It was continuous. 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock, yesterday, the day before, previous month, last year, all the way back, if we go back to when we were 10 years old, 9, 8, 7, 6, when we went back to 1 years old. Then when we went back to the time where we were inside our mother's wombs, the nine approximate months of gestation. Your mind was still existing in a very subtle form, not as active as now, but still existing. At the same time, when you were conceived at 10 o'clock, when you were conceived at 10 o'clock, at 9.59, your mind must have existed. In order for your mind to have existed at 10 o'clock, it must have existed at 9.59. Think about that carefully. Now, if you say to me, your body came from your parents, logically correct, scientifically can be proven. But if you say to me that your mind has come from your parents, scientifically, logically, I can debate with you. Then if your mind at 959 was inside your parents and it came out of your parents and entered your mother's womb, therefore to create your mind, then your mind must be a perfect offshoot of your parents' mind and their thinking and their likes and dislikes. Therefore, if your parents are geniuses, are experts good in music? You must be likewise. You must be the same. If your parents are not intelligent, you must be unintelligent. If your parents are highly intelligent, you must be geniuses. If your parents are swayed toward mechanisms or computers, you must be. If your parents are simple farmers, you must carry on and be a simple farmer. 
True. Certain conditions, certain things that we like is conditioned by being with our parents for an extended period of time. Because we've been there with them for a certain period of time, and we have been conditioned to like this and that and this and that. But deep down inside, our way of thinking is completely different than our parents. Mostly, 99.9% .9 of the time, it is thinking. That 0.01% that remains is coincidental. So if that's the case, we can logically debate and refute and say, if that line was existing at 10, logically, it must have been existing at 9.59. Now then you can ask yourself, where, were, where was that mine at 9.59? Where was that mine at 9.58, 9.57? It must have existed in order for it to exist at 10. All phenomena must exist on a continuous basis. It must have had a previous moment in order for it to have the next moment. It cannot just spontaneously arise at 10 o'clock. Any phenomenon, any object, whether it is living or it is not living. So where was your mind at 9.59? 9.58? 9 o'clock? 8 o'clock? It must have been existing outside of that womb in another form. Perhaps another dimension. That is your previous life. So in order for you to have your mind now, in order for it to exist at 10, it was existing at 9.59, most probably in your previous lives. Carried on. Like that, if you die at, if you die at 11 o'clock, whatever age in the future, at 11 o'clock, your physical body starts to starts to deteriorate. It is deteriorating, but it will deteriorate at a faster rate, a quicker rate, a more visible rate. It will deteriorate at in, starting 11 o'clock at a faster rate. Then, after a few months, you can say that it basically completely goes, deteriorate except for the bones, which will deteriorate again and again. It goes back into the earth. It will regenerate into another form. It will regenerate into another being, with mind or without mind. It will in fact become nourishment for another type of living being. So your body regenerates in another form. It continues into another form. Then at 11, where's your mind? When you die and you leave your body, where is your mind? 1101, 1102. Your body continues to exist in another form. Your mind also will exist in another form. It will continue. That will be your next rebirth. 